Hello, I'm Andrew Brace, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest Breeders Masterclass brought to you by Yukonuba in conjunction with Dog World Newspaper. These masterclasses enable breeders around the world to access online expert opinions on a variety of important subjects. Through the Yukonuba Dog World Breeders Masterclasses, enthusiasts can meet, maybe for the first time, well-known personalities whose knowledge of specific topics then becomes available to them. This comes to you from Long Beach in California, where Yukonuba is hosting its Yukonuba World Challenge competition, in which 41 dogs from different countries will compete to win best in show at what is now acknowledged as one of the most prestigious events in the canine calendar. In its quest to bring responsible and successful breeders, judges and handlers together from all around the world, Yukonuba has given us the opportunity to draw from some of the most experienced people in the sport. Have you ever wondered what skills are necessary to turn those good dogs into great dogs? How many times have you watched an expert handler showing a dog in the ring, seemingly without effort, and wondered if you too could ever display such talent? Hopefully today will help your understanding of handling in the show ring and enable you to improve your skills. Let me introduce our panelists. Michael Canalizo was a renowned handler, notably of the Grandier Afghan Hounds, and has since become a highly respected American Kennel Club judge. He works as the director of AKC Event Management, so has a very busy weekend ahead. We thank Michael for his time. You're welcome, Andrew. Mary Dukes was a professional handler who achieved great success, particularly with whippets. Mary now works as an American Kennel Club field representative and has a special interest in the AKC's Registered Professional Handlers Program, for which she acts as coordinator. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much, Andrew. The youngest member of our panel is Katia Rauhut, who began handling as a junior 11 years ago. Twice, she's represented her country at Crufts, and she now teaches Germany's up-and-coming junior handlers, passing on her knowledge and experience. Katia's family breeds Lhasa Apsos and Tibetan Terriers, and she's competing in the World Challenge with one of their Tibetans. Thank you, Katia, for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Peter Green is truly a legend in his own lifetime. Born in Wales, Peter emigrated to the USA many years ago, where he became one of the most successful professional handlers of all time. He is the only person to have handled best in show winners at both Crufts and Westminster an incredible four times, and now he's taken his talents into the judging ring. Indeed, this year alone, he judged the Terrier Group at Westminster and best in show at Crufts. Peter, we look forward to your input. Thank you, Andrew. The first question I have for our experts on the topic of handling is, do you feel that world-class handlers are born with a gift, or is this merely a skill that can be learnt? I think any person can be taught and trained in the technical skills, but I think without a doubt that emotional and intellectual connection you're born with. People that can look at a dog and, and see it and understand it on a different level rather than a skillful level. I think it's totally uh, inborn. So and some... it doesn't always arrive until you realize you've had a calling towards it. Sometimes you'll see somebody that makes an attempt and, and is just can take any dog any time and you see that they have some sort of unique relationship. Yeah, I think it's certainly the aptitude for it is um, innate. It's, it's inborn, the aptitude for the animal, the eye for to some degree it's an eye for art as much as it's an eye for a dog and, ba and balance. Um, I think a person can be made a, a, a person who is adequate, who has you know basic skills can certainly be made better through education, through watching other handlers, through learning different techniques, but I don't think they'll ever be world class. Katia, in your few years in the, in the dog game, you started very, very young. What are your feelings? A world-class handler is born with the gift. 
because um, you can't learn the feeling for the dog and uh, yeah, the attitude towards the dog. I think that's a born gift. You can learn the skills, but it's, it's born. At what age did you feel that this was something that you had a, a, a special feeling for? I got my first Tibetan Terrier at eight, and then I said I want to do junior handling, and at the first junior handling I won because they told me I have just the feeling for the dog, so I said, well, I have to continue. <laughs> Peter, a gift or something you can teach somebody? <clears throat> I think that someone um, can be taught and, and become very successful in dog hounds. But I think the ones who are really excel in a, a particular breed or in many breeds, they have a special feeling for dogs. I think to be successful, you really have to have a feeling for the dogs themselves, not treat them as an object. You have an inner feeling, you, get, you fall in love with the dog, the dog falls in love with you. you uh, the handler, most successful ha handlers I know have this great feeling for their dog. They understand how good the dog is and, and uh, if it's a super dog. They want to make everybody else think this dog is as good as what they think it is. So they have a great passion for it. They have um, a lot of people skills. They have a little charisma about them. They do it with a bit of a flair. If you are going to be successful in the showing of dogs, you have to have a passion for it. You have to love it. How much importance did you feel that judges placed on the handling rather than the actual dog? I don't think it's a conscious decision on the part of the judge. Um, in terms of, oh, well, that dog's being handled better than this one. I think, I think it's a matter of the handler is able to present the dog in a way to that judge that accentuates its good points and minimizes its faults. A good handler doesn't make themselves the main part of the picture. The good handler accentuates the good and minimizes the bad on the dog. So it shouldn't, I don't think it's a conscious thing on the part of the judges. Um, in terms of you know how the dog is being presented, just that that animal is being presented in its best light to that judge, mm -hmm. whether that's a professional handler or an owner handler, or it, it matters Peter. not. The thing is, to uh, you walk in the ring as a handler, you look around, <coughs> you um, watch what the judge is doing, you fall fall into line with the the way it's going, but you always have to do. If you think, and you know, actually, you know where you should be standing when it's all over. You know, I should be, uh, Michael's the one to beat, so I have to try to outshow Michael and do something better. When you look around the class, a good handler knows when he walks in the ring whether he thinks his dog is the best dog in the ring and he has to prove to, to the judge. Or, well, or he thinks to himself, well, I got the second best dog, but maybe I can beat the first best dog by doing this or doing that. And, a little bit of gamemanship, always, you know. Do you feel that owner handlers have in any way an advantage over professional handlers who may be showing a team of dogs? An owner handler has a distinct advantage over a professional handler because they know their own dog's idiosyncrasies. They're, of course, a handler may be having a dog that has some challenges that he can uh, uh, cover up or assist with. But the owner handler knows these dogs better, controls its destiny and as far as conditioning them and, and how they should be presented. And you become a specialist in your breed, especially if you're a breeder owner handler because you've had them since day one. And you know every single aspect of when they're gonna have a good day or when they're gonna have a bad day. And, and it certainly is an, a, a, an advantage as an owner handler. Katya, you are essentially an owner handler. You show mainly your own dogs. Would you agree with what Michael's saying? Well, I think as I'm a, a owner handler that um, you live 24 hours with that dog and you just know what he feels and if he has a bad day or a good day, I think you have advantage over the professional handlers. I mean, we don't have professional handlers in Germany, so it's, it's difficult to say because we don't have the comp compare as we ca can't compare if uh, a professional handler would do better in Germany or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. I think that Great. professional handlers are usually, um, usually, and we're talking about world-class dog handlers here, not just a regular old dog handler. Um, I think the, the best 
of our profession will certainly uh, do better with their dogs than, than amateur handler. I mean, if they've been breathing, they breed for years and years. But most, most professional handlers know <coughs> exactly what to expect from their dogs because they're with them all the time. You know, in this country, a handler might be going to 100, 100 shows a year without too much problem. They have to know everything about their dogs. They have to know uh, if it ate its food last night, uh, what its bowels was like this morning. Is, is, does he look like he's happy? Does he look like there's something wrong with him? So when they walk in the ring, they're fully prepared for anything that's going to happen. And usually, um, they talk about their dogs look, they've spent a lot of time with, with dogs that they're expecting to win with. I mean, it's not a matter of um, the assistant gets them all ready and the handler never sees them. That's not right. Most good dog handlers, even though they may have a team of assistants assisting them, they know everything about all their charges, whether what kind of conditioning, how the dog shows normally. Does he need a lot of geeing up before he walks in the ring, or does he do it all by himself? Or, you know, it's hard for an amateur, good amateur handler to be a good professional if that professional is, has a really good dog. So we've got two slightly different perspectives on that. One for you, Michael, and in view of the breed that you were probably most involved with, how important is, is understanding the character of your charge? Are some breeds easier than others when it comes to getting into their head? The character of a different type breed, being he's referring to my affiliation with sighthounds, is you have to understand a sighthound is smarter than your average dog, and if you're, you have a judge that asks you to run up and back towards a solid wall, that sighthound's going to look at you like, I'm not hitting that wall, and he's going to turn away. Um, so hopefully you're matched with a judge that understands the same sensibilities that every breed has. And uh, being a sighthound, that they would, they have to usually go on a loose lead on their own uh, agenda. You can't force them to do something. You can't ask for a dog to do more than they're willing to give. And it's, it's sometimes it's a challenge, but uh, they won't run off a surface without checking it out first. They know the difference between a, a mat and a shiny floor, and they prefer to stay on the mat. So sometimes they can show you how it should be done more than you showing them how it should be done. Mary. Like, as Michael alluded to, showing a golden retriever is a completely different animal than showing an Afghan hound. Completely mm -hmm. different animal. You have to be able to get into their heads um, and know what makes each dog and what makes each breed tick because there are things you can do with one breed that you certainly couldn't, couldn't do with another. So um, that's, it's critically important. Would you say that some breeds are actually easier to sort of get into their head than others? Oh, sure, sure. Which, which, uh, would be, which do you think are the, kind of the most Well, accessible? I remember the first time I ever covered a golden retriever for somebody, and I come from sighthounds, which are tricky. I remember the first time I covered a golden retriever for someone and I thought, well, that so-and-so has it so easy because all you have to do is hold the leash and they think you're their owner, you know, <laughs> and they love you and they want to do whatever um, you want them to do. Whereas sighthounds, you know, they're not a ringside dog. They're not a dog that you can hand off. Hand off. No, you have to, they no, have to know a, you for several days or several weeks not a pick -up breed. before they're willing to... Do for you. Peter, did you tend to adapt your handling styles to, to suit different judges? And do you think it's important well, that, that, to study the, the, the method of judging before you take a dog in the ring? You know, we're lucky here in the States because we meet the same judges a lot. And uh, so you get to know each judge's little, in, you know, the, what they like, how they like to do it. Some judges, they pick the winners as they walk in the ring, you know, they watch them go around the ring and, and they're picking out the dogs they really like. So. You, like I said, some judges, they don't even look when you walk in the ring. But, you know, you have to know each judge what they like, how they like you to do it. If you, you can't go too fast into some, you know. We used to even have judges that uh, if you, they told you to do a triangle and you did an L, well, you might as well forget it. They'd stop looking at you. All judges have their different um, uh, ways of judging. And, and you have to know when that fellow is really judging your dog or where he's just... Uh, looking at someone else's dog. You have to know all the time what the judge is doing. And you, and, and you learn that by all the times you show to them. And second of all, if you're any kind of a dog person, you, you should stand at ringside if you don't know what the judge is doing and watch just sure. uh, 
the way he's judging and, and make sure you do this, what he wants you to do because lots of judges get upset if you just don't do the way you want them, you, sure. they want it done. Sure. And you can make it a judge kind of mad at you without even trying. You know? yeah. So and that all comes into the fact whether you're doing it right or doing it wrong. And, Katia, you came up kind of through the junior handling ranks, so you started young and, and obviously you came through a more kind of formal sort of training background um, than Peter did, for example. Um, were you taught that, you know, you should always sort of study the, the method of judging before you show a dog? I always watched the, the judges uh, before I entered the ring because in Germany it's sometimes really difficult because you have some judges that don't like you to stack the dog. Okay. I had once uh, showing a Bernese mountain dog and I stacked the dog and he said, if I see you doing this again, I will disqualify you. Oh, nice judge. Yeah, nice judge. Mm. So I always yeah. look before <laughs> I enter. <laughs> Definitely want to be booked for junior showmanship. <laughs> yes. make, make a note, Mr. Cannelly, So, um, Actually, you've just raised an interesting point um, about, about stacking and, and free showing. Um, Michael, I mean, I've seen you many times do a fabulous job with, with free showing Afghans. What are your feelings about stacking dogs versus free showing? I think every judge prefers to see a dog standing on its own. It's a great leveler. You can have a, a well-handled dog of medium quality that's held together great. And if it stands on its own, you might see things that a handler can't at that point hide. And you can have a a casually handled dog that may not be stacked well by the owner's inability or novice level, but when it stands on its own, everything's there in front of you. So it's a great determinator. If you have a, you're not quite sure how to do, let the dog make the decision for you. Sure. Mary? I agree with that for the most part, with the caveat being that um, some breeds don't lend themselves to that. Mm -hmm. Basset hounds. You know, it's unfair. So you, and you're like, if there's a best in show lineup and your a Doberman is competing with a Basset Hound, well, the Doberman's going to nail the free stack every time. It, mm. It's very hard for a breed like a Basset or a Sussex or something like that to go into the middle of the ring and nail it because it's just not who they are. It's not the character of the breed. Mm. Um, so it, within the framework that it's in the character of the breed to do that, it's great because you can see where their legs fall without them being manipulated where their top line is without it being manipulated sure but but it, it again it's dependent how much I don't think you meant that they had to nail it just to see them i mean a, a sure. good basset will still stand up on sure. good pastures and, oh, sure, and sure, sure, sure. you know but see, mary's totally right a, a wolfhound doesn't do it or yeah. the tail shouldn't be up it's really just to look at balance and how they pot the posture and how they of the stand breed. On their own well, a you well, have to a know well, a well constructed yes. dog will always mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. to rest. A toy should come out and stand there and look happy cuz that's all it's bred to do. Sure. You know, a doberman has to look like he's watching and every breed has its you know, we sure. trust it's the judges know the will know the differences. Breed. The sure. character yes, of each Yes, the breed. running and flying around to a stop is not the desired. It's a Ellsworth gamble calm come to an end and just let the dog be a dog type of performance. Sure. Another aspect of, of handling where there's a little bit of controversy is the, and, and dare I say it, particularly in this country, um, <laughs> is about the speed with which so many show dogs are moved. Um, Peter, what are your feelings on speed versus breed specific? The fact is that um, it's really silly a lot of times, and I even saw it last night, when a, a little dog is run and and it, it's not the way they should be. Um, little, little tiny, little toy dogs running around with a handle going 100 miles an hour, I, I think that's all wrong. The breed specific um, movement is what you require. And of course, it's very nice to see an Afghan running around flowing and the handle flying around. It, it look, that breed, it looks good. And in many breeds, they look good. But when they start running terriers and running toy dogs and, and um, that it, it, it totally destroys it for me. And, and uh, some of our best judges, if you ran around the ring, they would, they would say, hey, you know, what you're doing, Stop, slow it down. And, and, and yeah. more or less, um, and good handlers know who they can fool by running and, uh, and who they can't. And the better judges will always tell you, hey, that's not how they should be moving, moving at the correct speed. 
Katia, do you find with, with young handlers, um, particularly in, in Europe, that there is maybe a little bit of a temptation to, to move their dogs perhaps a little faster than they should for the breed? Yeah, we have, especially in the main ring, you have some international judges, and if you just speed, they think, oh, well, that's a nice movement. Just, I'm like Lazas. I mean, Lazas are not supposed to run like an Afghan hound. No, you want a jaunty but, movement. But if you have the international judges, they always think they have to run with this Laza, even if it, if it can't run. I mean, they just speed like an Afghan hound. And it I, have a, I think I have heard it or have been taught to me somewhere, a good dog should move well at any speed. And the dog that's racing around the ring probably looks just as right on a nice collected trot as it was meant to be. The standards are specific. You know, an Afghan hound says, fast on a, on a loose lead. And this young lady's totally right. When she says big ring, we would equate that to our best in show. Sure. And it always kicks itself up a notch. At the breed level, when you breed specific and the ring is maybe somewhat, you know, n modest, you don't get that advantage, but then you get in the group and there's a little more hype and, and all of a sudden you're going a little faster and by the time you get into best in show or the main ring, all hell breaks loose. Everything and goes then up sometimes again. it's the run. Peter says it. You have to know which ones are gonna take offense to it and you know, and you pray you don't break gate or break your leg, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, did you ever use food as bait? Well it depends on what motivates that particular dog, which is something else that that no, you don't. A world class, you know, I mean, we're talking as somebody, whether it's an owner or a professional, sure. somebody at a really high level knows that. Um, with some dogs, it's, you know, food, be that chicken or liver or biscuits or whatever works for that individual dog. Mm -hmm. You have to, again, get into that particular dog's head and figure out what works for that dog. Mm -hmm. um, and I think another thing that's important, um, and I always talk to my clients, is that getting dogs into the getting their head into the fact that dog shows are fun and it's a fun place for them to be and um, from the time they're little and uh, that is really important because then they're more willing and more able to emote which is what you've got to get them to to do to make mm -hmm. the say in this country particularly yeah. to make to make the sale Peter yeah. I'm, I'm sure you've employed every trick in the book you know when they bait dogs you know, you see a lot of these people baiting their dog in the ring, whether it be with liver, cheese, whatever. And, and the judge is trying to look at the dog, and the handler sticks a piece of liver in its mouth, and it's about this big, and, and the dog is chewing it away, you know, and, and the judge is trying to examine it, and the poor dog can't swallow it. And, and the, the secret to baiting, first of all, when the judge is trying to go over your dog, I mean, you might get his attention as the judge is walking up by doing something with your hand. So he thinks you may have some bait. And so the dog is alert and looking at his best. But when the judge is going over it, don't be feeding it. A lot of these handlers are always feeding the dog when they're trying to go over it. The second thing is, when you do give them something, you give them a tiny, tiny piece. So they only get this taste in their mouth. They don't get a, a lump that they have to chew and swallow. And I think that that's where a lot of um, good dog handlers do wrong. They give them, they give them a piece to eat sure. and not a, a taste, a smell, or whatever it sure. is of it. Sure. And uh, I think that's the really bad thing that a lot of handlers do. When the judge is walking up, they give them a piece of food, and the dog is chewing it, the judge is trying to go over it, immediately the judge gets annoyed because he doesn't want to be looking at the dog mm -hmm. chewing. He's trying to look at the dog's expression and its shape of its head and eye and all so, but. Um, you know, like I said, like Mary said, a lot of dogs, it's different things. I uh, This Edel did wonderful winning, and I used to just put the ball in my pocket, and then when I wanted her to really look, I'd put it out like this, so she was waiting for you to do something with it, and then i put it back in my pocket, but she was standing all fours, a tail waiting, because after the dog show was over, we had a thing where we'd turn her loose and throw a ball for her. Sure. She'd chase it for an hour, but, you know, that was her... So she Big was thing in life. She was expecting yeah, playtime. Yeah, right. Yeah. What works for you, Katya? Have you got any little secrets that work with your I just Tibetans? have. All the Tibetans, they love to eat, so I just need a, a sausage or a chicken in, in my pocket and just show it, and that's enough. 
Yeah. One thing, generally after the dogs do their down and back and then they come and stop in front of the judge and that's when the judge is looking for them to show expression. And a common mistake that I see owner handlers, professional handlers, they'll do the down and back, the, ask the dog to emote, and then they never pay the dog. The judge will send them to ask them to go around to the end of the line and they just take off and they never pay the dog. Well, pretty soon that dog figures out that at the end of the down and back, they're, there's, they're gonna, you're going to ask them to put up their ears, but they're never going to get paid. So there's no reward. There's, there's no reward. No there's no reward. And that's when you see dogs that people can't figure out why mm -hmm. after the, they finish their down and back and ask the dog to bait, the dog won't do it. Well, sure. he doesn't do it because he knows no. he's not going to get a reward. Sure. So you have to, after you do your down and back and you stop and ask the dog, then the judge will ask you to take him around. Take a it takes five seconds tiny piece, yeah. to give them a little piece yeah. and pay them, mm, yeah. so they know they're going to get paid. Michael, Afghans, not the easiest breed, as we said earlier. So how, how did you motivate your Afghans? Bait wasn't uh, the, the way to do it, because the standard asks for a low set ear. So you certainly don't want You don't want ears up. You don't want ears up. And the Afghans would, if I can give away some little secrets. Yes, please. You, you, they usually had a special person, and they would scan, and they'd pull up to look at that person, so you'd pray that they're out there. I'm not going to use the double handling word, but because it's not something they'd think of in Afghans. But there's always a little something. And I have to say, in over 100 and something best in shows I'm on, this lady to my left is the only person ever to ask me on a very subtle thing I used to do with the sight hounds is I would pick up the front leg, and I wasn't fixing it while the judge was moving to the rear, but I'd pick it up at the exact precise time that they, if they were a good dog person, would know to check for muscle on the dog for conditioning, which is so important in a sight hound. And as they'd go to feel the rear leg's muscle, that front leg would just lift off the ground and they'd flex because they'd be taken off a little unbalanced. Mary is the only one in over 150 best in shows of seeing that, that realized there's a reason to do it. You always and, lifted and, that foot. Oh, and yeah. What was that and, about? Yeah, she yeah. Was, so I mean, <laughs> even at a certain level, you're always looking, you're always trying to f find out there's got to be something. I'm, and I had great people in the sport teach me things from Peter and Jimmy Moses on handling leads and things. So there's so many minute things that anybody can learn, and, and most of the people that are considered professionals I uh, will share it sure. without yeah. hesitation. And w well yeah. done, Mary, on rumbling him. Yeah, yeah. It was, I was retired <laughs> when well, she like, asked. Why is he doing that? He always does that little <laughs> lift the foot thing. Yeah, and you weren't, you didn't move it. No. I mean, you didn't, it just was up. And that's, it was brilliant, by the way, because that would do that. It would, the judge would feel. Yeah. And as they'd feel, feel they, and then they'd, because then they're on three yeah. legs. Yeah, very Clever. smart. And finally, I have to ask, do you feel that successful handlers go on to make successful judges? Yes, definitely. I mean, they, if they've had it, most handlers, when they get to the judging um, part of life, they've been showing dogs for many, many years, and they, they've probably shown a lot of very good dogs if they've been successful. And so they must have learned a lot. They, if you just don't take a new breed of dog as a handler, and, um, and if it's a good one, um, to know it's a good one, you have to really look at everybody else and talk to the people who really know, and that's how you learn. So um, anybody that's had a, a, a good winning dog on the string that they actually are trying to win with, first of all, the first thing a handler does is find out how good is this dog really, just because the owner tells you it's a really good Staffordshire Bull Terrier. If you don't, if you've never been showing them, you have to go and find out, is this people telling me the truth? Uh, you know, what, what makes a really good Staffordshire Bull Terrier? So you, over a career, you show a lot of breeds of dogs and, and, and you've learned a little bit about a lot of things, a lot of breeds of dogs. So when it comes to the judging uh, part of, of life, at least you have a head start. You've shown a lot of good breeds of dogs and you understand what makes a good Afghan, a Whippet, whatever, Basta. Even when you're standing in, in the group ring every night, you know, 150 times a year or 120 times a year. Character. You look at all the other breeds in the group, you, you see when you're not winning, you see a dog 
that's no. doing a lot of winning, a really great dog in a particular breed. Well, you, you look at it, and, and after looking at it a hundred times, you learn a lot about the breed. Talk to the handler, talk to the, you get to know the breeders. So a breed you're not even showing, you, you have an opportunity to learn a lot about them going through life as a handler. To answer your thing, does a great handler make a great judge? They do because of the basic premise of they had integrity to make them a great handler. They knew when they were a handler if the judge was beating them to a better dog and they knew, respected that decision. And they understand the premise of evaluating breeding stock and rewarding it on that premise should be done. And as it, they take that same integrity and they're not gonna walk into a ring and say, you know, all right, I showed him a bunch of great ones and now I'm gonna put up my best friend because, you know, he's sure. been a good friend. They, they, you stand on your, your foundation and, and I think it just lives with you. You don't sacrifice or lower yourself from changing from sure. one aspect to the other. That pretty much wraps up our Breeders Masterclass on what makes a world-class handler. I'd like to think that the opinions of our four experts have whetted your appetite somewhat and probably spurred you on to maybe one day, if you're not already, become yourself a world-class handler. So on your behalf, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Michael, to Mary, to Katya, and to Peter. Thank and thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.